Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm assuming everyone can see that screen and I'm sure Gwen will tell me if uh, you can't. Uh, tonight, I'm going to talk about silage quality. It's specifically aimed at the dairy sector and rightly or wrongly, I've chosen, given the time constraints, to focus on clamp silage. But if you have any burning bale questions at the end, please feel free to ask. Uh, I've got my email address there and I'm happy if you email me directly if you've got any questions after the meeting as well. So I'm going to focus on quality. Uh, and I'm going to start with a quote actually. One cannot emphasize too strongly the importance of cutting herbage young for silage. And this quote was actually from 1951 and nothing's really changed. Uh, and I think uh, some people are now coming back round to this uh, importance of cutting young with the multi-cut system. And I will say a little bit about the multi-cut system tonight. Um, I have done a presentation previously devoted to that, but I think it's an important area that we need to focus on, particularly in the dairy sector where we can improve the utilisation of silage through the quality of that silage and can actually get far more nutrition from silage if we go down the route of cutting frequently. Uh, Multi-cut tends to mean a five to six cut system in a year. I would prefer that we focus on the cutting interval, not the number of cuts we do. And, and I can talk about that uh, in a minute. So if we just, um, if we just think about what we're doing and what's happening to the grass in the field, then actually, um, we, as the grass grows, as we go from leafy material here on the left hand side, which is 78 cent B, right the way through to full um, head and seed head, we're down at 58 cent B. What happens within that grass during that transition from leafy to semi material is the main constituents are changing. NDF in particular is increasing. And the most notable part of this is actually the lignin, because it's the lignin, lignin that makes that um, plant cell wall less digestible. The ash is decreasing, the lipid is decreasing, the crude protein is decreasing, and the sugars are increasing. And really, in terms of high quality silage, we need to be nearer this left hand side. For example, here at this example, 11.6 ME, 72.7 B, rather than here, in terms of the milking cow or the high producing um, uh, cattle and sheep. So here, in terms of milk production, we really need to be at this point or even slightly above that point for our high quality silage. And if we just focus on the, on the composition at those two points, we can see we've got lower levels of NDF, we've got low levels of sugar and high levels of protein. The, the main challenge with this sugar to protein ratio is the fact that that silage is therefore more hard, more difficult to ensile, to preserve, but we have far more nutrition and that nutrition is important. So if we just look at uh, what happens when we delay cutting, and this is delay cutting at each cut. If we delay cutting, we get an increase in yield at that point, at that cut, 10% if we delay by a week. The digestibility is dropping by three and a half units, the ME by 0.6 units over that time, so half a unit per day, digestibility drop. And we actually have higher field losses because when we have a heavier crop, it takes longer to wilt that crop. And so with a long wilt time, we're losing sugar, we're losing some protein. So we're actually reducing our digestibility because we're reducing that in the field. And we have a slower regrowth. And this is why I'm promoting this, this more frequent cutting system because in an annual basis, by having a more frequent cutting, we are improving our total annual yield. And the debate only comes about the amount at each cut. And that is a debate that we can have at the end. So this is some data from a farm in Pembrokeshire where um, the Ecosile team did a, uh, an on-farm study within the same field. They had a conventional cut. It was done a couple of years ago versus a five cut system. And this was the annual yield over those three cut or five cut system. And we can see that there was actually a 0.92 tons of dry matter per hectare improvement with the five multi cut um, system. When we look at ME on a dry matter basis, it was 0.48 megajoules of energy more per kilogram dry matter with the multi cut silage as an average over the three cut conventional silage. And if we did that on an annual yield per hectare, 
comes out at 18,582 megajoules per hectare more over comparing the three cut to the five cut. And if we then take that figure of 18.58, 18, 18,000 megajoules and use a, a figure of 5.3 megajoules to produce a kilo of milk, that gives us an extra three and a half thousand kilograms of milk per hectare by cutting more frequently. And the system in this experiment was actually a four to five week regrowth on the multi-cut and it was pushing a seven week regrowth on average with the three cut conventional system. So yes, we can say the conventional system was possibly a bit older than you would normally do, but you can see the benefit there in terms of milk yield. The other thing that we have a benefit in, in with this multi-cut system, and again, this is, this is using this ecocell data, is crude protein. So on a dry matter basis, there was 28 grams per kilogram more crude protein in every um, kilo of dry matter, or 2.8% on a percentage basis. And again, if we do that over a total yield per hectare basis, that's 613 kilograms more protein. So if we actually consider that and the value of that, the additional value in terms of milk, and I'm taking a price of 28 pence per litre, is 981 pounds per hectare because of that additional um, metabolizable energy per hectare. And then if you take the protein, 613 kilograms of protein. So if we were buying a 20% protein cake, that's 3.06 3 tons, uh, at a value of 230 pounds per ton, that's 703 quid. So if we add those two up, that's 1,685 pounds per hectare by this multi-cut system. So that's hopefully persuading you that, whilst I, I, I use the term multi-cut, that maybe we should be going at a four to five week and you know five just over five weeks maybe depending on the growing season as our time for cutting for this high quality silage for our high producing dairy cows or any milk production cows it doesn't fit in terms of your dry cows because it'd be too good a, a silage and uh, absolutely the wrong thing to do but for the, the milk producers i think it's something that we should all be considering now i said there were some challenges with this approach and this is true if you've got a clover sword as well, um, there is a relationship between the protein content in the grass and the sugar content in the grass. So where we've got these high quality protein silages or protein grasses, we actually have low levels of sugar. So high protein means low sugar in the sward at cutting. Low sugar, sorry, low protein, high sugar. And that's important because where we have high protein and low sugar, that's more difficult to carry out that fermentation process. Where we've got plenty of sugar and no protein, low protein, then it's easy to ferment. And it's difficult to ferment partly because the sugar drives the silage fermentation, but partly because the protein in that grass actually stops the pH coming down. It buffers it, much like a bicarb buffer does in the room and if you're, if you're feeding a bicarb buffer. So it stops the pH coming down, so you need more acid to bring the pH down. It's very important that if we're going down this high quality route of making silage for dairy cows, that we actually focus on the silage preservation process. So there's some challenges and opportunities. And like I said, when we have high protein, more difficult to ferment. But actually, that silage at feed out is less likely to heat up because it becomes more aerobically stable. Low sugar, like I said, more difficult to ferment. Low sugar in terms of aerobic stability, that silage is much more stable. So there's, there's, there's winds there as well. There is potential with this Type of system where we're cutting more frequently that we can have carryover of slurry or fertilizer and again that's something we need to be careful of so if we're going down a, a more regular cutting we really need to focus attention on how we're applying slurry and it should only be going on at the roots with a, with a trailed shoe or a dribble bar right at the root or injection and no surface spreading and again we need to think about our fertilizer application so that we're not over applying nitrogen but, you know, these things in terms of uh, fermentation, making them more, more difficult, actually, again, make it more aerobically stable at feed out because you have a slightly less um, beneficial fermentation. So you have more of the end products that inhibit the yeast and molds that cause the heating at feed out. The young crop, there's less dead material in it. And that dead material is where all the wrong bacteria and yeast and molds are that cause the problems of uh, ensiling and, and aerobic stability. So again, Young crop, less dead material, it's actually easier to ferment on this one and it's more aerobically stable. So that's a win-win. And then on the last thing, young crop, less fibre, it's easier to consolidate. So again, we can get better density in our silage clamp and that's a better fermentation. And because there's better density, there's less oxygen trapped, 
So again, that's better aerobic stability. So again, in terms of our preservation process, there are a few things on the left-hand side that we need to think about, but many of the problems in terms of aerob aerobic spoilage actually become far less problematic. And heating of silage when we're making these higher quality silage is much less of an issue. So our focus needs to be on the fermentation. And so I bring you up, and this is probably the worst slide of this evening, and it's showing all the microbial groups that are present on your grass and present in your silage. And if we just, you know, we could focus a lot of attention on these, but what I want you to do is focus on this one. This one's a good one. All the rest of these are undesirable. Some are more undesirable than others, but if we could get rid of them all, we would make excellent quality silage. So you can see why when we're looking at fermentation and quality, we need to focus uh, to, to reduce all these and benefit these to get that good fermentation. So that's it. I could go in and talk about this slide for quite some time, but this evening I won't. We need to focus on that previous slide because everything we do from the point of cutting alters the balance between the good bacteria and the bad microorganisms. And that starts in the field of cutting. So ideally, we should have a cutting height of seven and a half to 10 centimeters, which is shown here with this, this ruler, and we should spread the crop immediately, and that will reduce the risks of uh, contaminating that silage further or those bacteria that are on there that we don't want growing more. And, you know, just take a look at this slide. This was at a, at a um, grassland event of uh, showing machinery event, unfortunately here in Wales, and we can see there that's not, uh, water flying, that's soil flying because that drum mower or that mower was set too low. And that is the key thing. If we start by contaminating that grass with soil because we cut too low, we always are fighting a bigger battle against those clostridia that we've introduced because of that soil contamination. And every gram of soil contains one million clostridia. So if we cut too low, below that seven and a half centimetre cutting height, we increase the level of clostridia on our crop we increase the risks of a butyric acid and an ammonia uh, fermentation in the silo. The other thing about cutting too low, and this is a good example here, if we actually look at the forage, and this was cut again at that same event, we can actually see they've sculpted some of the roots off there. Now, if we consider, I said seven and a half centimeters, so let's say it's about here. What are we doing by cutting at seven and a half centimeters is we're leaving this fiber in the field. That's the poorest digestible part of any grass. We're also using that stubble, which would then be left in the field, to hold the grass up on it as you've cut it, and that allows air to come underneath it and actually improves the wilting. And by leaving this in the field, we're not putting it in the silage clamp, which means the cows don't have to eat it, which improves their overall digestibility. So there's absolutely no reason to cut too low. We increase the yield of the cut very, very marginally, but actually, because we're introducing those clostridia, we run the risk of having higher dry matter losses, so actually producing less silage because of invisible dry matter losses. So the problem is that if we cut too low, we have more fiber, which is less nutrients every mouthful that cow eats. And because there's more fiber, actually it takes longer to clear the rumen, so we actually have overall a lower intake, so they're eating less mouthfuls. That's a double whammy. Put those two together, we've got less uh, energy from our forage. And because we've got less energy, we end up supplementing it more. So we have lower forage intake, requiring more concentrate supplementation. So more money on that lorry that's coming onto the yard rather than from our forages. And we have the, the added downside that we have a slower regrowth, regrowth of that forage because if you've cut so low, it takes that forage so much longer to, to recover that we end up with a poorer forage yield. And that doesn't matter whether you're on a multi-cut system or on a conventional six-week regrowth. The same is true. In fact, it's actually worse on your on your six week regrowth because you've got much more fiber in that lower area and it's also taking longer to regrow because you've got a longer um, cut, uh, interval between cuttings. So just looking at that clostridia, this is some work from Parika Kiley at, uh, in Chagask in, in Southern Ireland. And they showed in his group that uh, if we put it two centimeters, there was 84,000 clostridia in every gram contaminating the forage that was cut from it. Whereas if it was a 10 centimetre cutting height, that was 4,000. So 80,000 less clostridia when we cut at 10 centimetres compared to 2 centimetres on every gram of forage. That's a huge potential inoculation. That's almost as much as some inoculants are applying in terms of bacteria. Not quite, but it's getting there. 
and that's good bacteria that they're applying. So the other thing is that we must spread that crop as quickly as possible after we've cut it. You now, modern mowers are generally, mower conditions are spreading. If you've got the tailgate on the mower wide, it's spreading over that area. There's still a benefit of going in there and spreading again, but if you're using a, a drum mower or you're not spreading it with the, with the mower as you go over, it's absolutely essential you get it in there and spread it. And the reason being is that on the leaf, and this is a, a transverse section through a, a brass leaf, you've got these stomata um, on the leaf or pores on the leaf. When those pores are open, we actually lose 100 litres of water per tonne per hour. When they close, that drops to 20 litres per tonne per hour. And they only stay open for a couple of hours after cutting. So the quicker we can spread that crop so that there's more surface area to volume ratio, the quicker we wilt, the better our silage quality will be. We reach our target of 30 to 32% dry matter much more quickly. And it reduces the aerobic respiration in the field and losses in the field. Now, Ideally, we use a conditioner, and there's a number of different types of conditioners, and they will improve that wilting even more. It's still important to spread that crop to maximize that ability to wilt. So if we don't, well, anyway, in the field, we are getting what I call respiration. The plant has been cut, it's not photosynthesizing, but it is respiring. So the sugar is being converted to carbon dioxide and water, and that's a loss of energy. And it actually means that we're increasing the undigestible fraction of that grass. So the longer it wilts, the more this process happens. And that's why this rapid wilt is so critical in producing high quality silage. This is a, a study from a farm not far from me here, uh, near to me here in Aberystwyth. And this was a study where we took three fields and we actually measured the uh, dry matter as it increased from the point of cutting, it was kind of about 10 o'clock in the morning, well, 10 to 12 on the three different fields. Uh, we monitored the dry matter in the field uh, until it would reach the silage clamp. And again, just before it went over with a forage harvester, in that same point in the field, we measured the dry matter. Now I said the target should be 30 to 32. So if we take, take it here as our target, that would have been after approximately 12, 13 hours. That, sorry, that forage could have been picked up and put in the clamp. Instead, this particular farmer, and I hope he's not listening tonight, uh, would be 38% dry matter. I do know that if he was uh, listening, he'd be giving me some banter back, but anyway. When we had that extensive wilt, this is the same farm, what happened was that the sugar in the grass at cutting was 22.9%. By the time it was forage harvested, it had dropped 18.7%. And what had happened to that extra 4.2% sugar was that it had been converted to carbon dioxide and water. Now, when we convert the sugar to carbon dioxide and water, what it means is the fiber fraction has increased relatively. Uh, the ash fraction has increased relatively. So when we actually look at the digestibility now, at mowing and at cutting, we'd actually lost in that field for every kilogram of dry matter, we'd lost 0.7 megajoules of energy because of that loss of sugar. It's 4% in D value, 0.7 megajoules of energy. It's a huge loss because we'd wilted too long. Now we can never get zero losses in the field. But the quicker we wilt means we reduce those losses and we increase the ability to preserve more nutrients in our silage. So just looking at that data again and putting some values on it. So it's the same farm, wilting losses of 4.5% because we had a 0.3% loss of protein as well as that 4.2% loss of sugar. Yield at mowing was 5.5 tons of dry matter per hectare. By the harvest, it was 5.25. So a loss of a quarter of a ton of dry matter per hectare of yield. Now we can look at the sugar content, uh, sugar yield, but I'm more interested in the ME yield. So ME yield was down by 6,650 megajoules per hectare because of that wilting loss of that sugar. And that represents, if we use 5.3 megajoules to make a kilo of milk, 1,250 litres of milk or kilos of milk per hectare because of that extensive wilt. Now, I would imagine that if we controlled that a bit better, we'd reduce that speed, that time of wilt, we could have reduced that milk loss uh, down to 700. So we could have halved it in effect. So it's an important thing to, to think about of these field losses. And you can't see them because they're, they're invisible. It's about the plant respiring. Now, this is a, a different study um, done from Devon uh, last year. 
three different crops here. There was a grass crop, a grass yeah. clover mix, and a multi-species sward mix with some herbs in there. Uh, the, the, the forage was cut at 9.30, and again, they, they followed the dry matter in the field. 17.30, so up to 5.30 in the evening. Came again the next morning at 9.30, and we can see the wilting overnight is very, very poor. And that's because it's overcast, it's, you know, it's dark, there's some uh, moisture coming out in terms of the um, dew. So ideally, both this study and other studies that we've done show that we should really try and now, these days, get our wilt time down to within a day. So we cut in the morning when the dew is risen, and we pick up the same day if possible. And that will give us a much better wilt, it'll hit that target and it'll reduce those losses. Now, I know that's a huge challenge, both in terms of getting the contractor in and it's a huge amount of work. But if we're going for um, a more frequent cutting, we've actually got less uh, yield there. So actually it, it may be possible. And I do know farms that have gone down this route and they are making significantly better silage. Now, again, if we've cut too low, we end up breaking too low. And again, this is the same demo, um, grassland demo, machinery demo. And you can see there clouds of soil. So it's very important that we set the rates so that we know we're not scraping earth and causing that to come into our grass. Uh, similar story rowing up. When we cut low, we've got the rake low to get it all in. So it's much better off to leave that seven and a half centimeter cutting height so that that grass is sitting on a bed of stubble and it avoids some of these soil issues. And that's what's happened. This is a, a different farm. Uh, and we can see here some serious soil contamination and that forage was then uh, made into silage. And, you know, you can get away with it, but you're increasing the risks of a poorer fermentation. Next thing when on the, on the um, in siling is actually compaction. And it's probably after cutting too low, the second biggest problem I see wherever I travel. And that doesn't matter which country I'm in. Entity in the silage clamp is a big issue. And we need to have a target. Target would be 750 kilograms of fresh matter in every meter cubed. So that's three quarters of a ton per cube. And to do that, we need to put in 15 centimeter layer depths. As soon as we increase those layer depths above that, we're making our job of compaction much more difficult. And to be honest, it doesn't matter how many times you roll it, you will never get to the same level of compaction as if you put in 15 centimeter layer depths. And that is quite a hard job with grass silage but we need to focus on using our loading shovels. Uh, the push-off loading shovels, in my opinion, are the best. So you can push off a small amount as you drive up. And if you've got that going up the whole length of that clamp from the, from the base of the ramp all the way to the back of the clamp, it is much easier to do like that rather than taking a big lump and dumping it and then trying to spread it out afterwards. And when you see some of the people doing that and they're doing it properly, it is a relatively easy job and they can then roll it once and they've actually hit that compaction target. Now, I do like uh, the compactors, railway wagon wheels on, on, um, on a chassis. These were developed in the Czech Republic. They've been using them for many years. And what it does is it means we can compact a whole tractor width in one go rather than just a wheel width. And when you compact with a wheel width, often the grass in between bounces back up after you've passed by. With this, it tends to hold it down better because you're compacting a bigger surface area in one go. Now, this is a study done uh, at Wisconsin in the States, one of the main forage uh, universities in the States. And they showed that if you went from a 15 centimeter layer depth to a 30 centimeter layer depth, so they doubled it, and you use the same machinery, that increase in tail layer depth meant that the overall density was reduced by 100 to 120 kilograms for every um, on a fresh matter basis. So layer depth, like I said, is the key. Keep those 15 centimeter layer depths and we'll have a damn, you know, much better job of getting that compaction right. And this is a study just showing the effect of compaction on the losses that we have in the silage clamp. Uh, it was a survey of 35 farms in the States and the density he now is on a dry matter basis. I quoted on a fresh matter basis. So uh, 750 is about 250 if it's 30% dry matter. So they had farms with poor density, 160 kilograms per cubic meter dry matter versus 320. And we can see the levels of losses. 20% so losses when it was poor density, only 10% when it was high density. 10% is about the best you'll ever get in a silage clamp. 
Now, 20% losses, that means for every five loads of grass that came into that clamp, they only had four loads of silage left to feed out. So it's a massive loss, and that was all driven by that density. We have poor density, we trap oxygen, we grow the wrong bacteria, we grow the wrong yeasts, and we end up with much more respiration and losses of good nutrients. And then the next thing, and this one does frustrate me again, when I go on farm and they say they sheeted correctly, and often they haven't. And it's essential that we use a side sheet that goes all the way down to the floor. My ideal that it comes in a bit, maybe a metre along the floor, but you know, if it goes down to the floor, I'm relatively happy. And that side sheet is long enough to be folded over so that there's a significant overlap with any top sheet that comes on. Now, that's a, a rather schematic. I'll, I'll put another one up now. So we've got our side clamp, we've got our side sheet in, we've filled the clamp. Ideally, we want to use a cling film, and then we fold in our side sheet, we put our top sheet on, and then around the edge of that clamp, we have uh, gravel bags touching all the way down the wall, side walls, back wall, all the way down the ramp and all the way along the front. And we do that because we can trap the carbon dioxide in the clamp. When we trap carbon dioxide, it's actually a first silage additive for free. And we always produce some carbon dioxide. And that starts to inhibit all those aerobic bacteria and the respiration carried out in the clamp. And you preserve more nutrients. Um, just as, as we are in a high rainfall area in Wales here, this is an idea for outdoor clamps that can stop water penetrating the clamp during storage. So often a lot of the water that falls on the clamp, if we've got slopes on it, that water will actually go down the side of the clamp, soak back in underneath the side sheet and cause serious dry matter issues here, lower dry matter in this region of the clamp. Now, if you've got outdoor clamps, and what I'm suggesting is that we actually put a gravel bag down on top of the um, first sheet that we put on and we pull the side sheet up and over that gravel bag, and put another uh, gravel bag here and that means that water is trapped here so during storage before feed out the only way it can escape that clamp is off the front of the clamp down the down the ramp and out the front so it's not contaminating the silage the only time it contaminates the silage is at feed out and if we uh, cut our top sheet back so that it's maybe a couple of inches hanging over the face then that water will then fall off the face not into the silage and hopefully the, um, the face is uh, oh, it's well cut and, and clean and vertical and hopefully the walls at the front of the, uh, the, the floor at the front of the clamp is fo floating forward so again we're reducing water contamination because water contamination can cause a reduction in the dry matter and therefore a reduction in the quality and a reduction in intake in the cows. It also causes significant variability in your silage which means that on a day-to-day -day basis you may be feeding more or less forage because the dry matter's changed and you're not aware of that more or less concentrate to, to, to balance that up. And so we end up with the overfeeding concentrate at times causing acidosis. So controlling this water ingress is also beneficial in terms of the animal. I'm gonna talk about the silage fermentation. Uh, this is my favorite bacterium, Lactobacillus plantarum. It's an electron micrograph of that. And when we're making these high quality silages with low fiber, high protein, and this is the type of bacterium we need to to control that fermentation to maximize our nutrient preservation in the silo. I just want to talk about additives to a little bit and where our advice is coming from. And unfortunately, most of it is coming from the additive companies. Now, this is the average dry matter in UK silages, GB silages here. Um, this is data from uh, Eurofins that have silage analysis across all these companies, countries. And we can see the GB is just above 30% dry matter, 31. The way they analyze that uh, in Eurofins is actually slightly incorrect for, for the UK system. And if you had analysis from other labs, the means would be slightly lower than that. Now, uh, countries like Norway are similar, but many of those countries are higher. And I'm just circling three here, Germany, Denmark, and Austria. This is where most of the silage additives that come into this country are made. You can see the higher dry matter. We have got good production facilities of some additives in the UK, but uh, there's a lot coming in from these and they focus their attention on higher dry matter silages. And that's fine for their countries, but when they start to introduce them into the UK, that can cause a problem because they're the wrong sorts of additives for the UK. And if they've got the wrong uh, additive in there, you can have detrimental effects on the fermentation. You might improve aerobic stability, but there is an issue. 
And I just want to explain this difference in dry matter in a, in a, it's a, it's not scientifically correct, but it's going to give you um, what is happening. So if we've got 25% dry matter, we've actually got 75% of our, or 750 grams in our kilogram of water. Whereas at 35% dry matter, we've only got 650 grams in our kilogram water. Now, it's the acid that we produce in that silage in the liquid phase that preserves the crop. So these two silages, these theoretical silages, both had 100 grams per kilogram dry matter acid. But like I said, it's the acid in the liquid phase that causes the preservation. So if we look at this drier silage, actually there's 0.154 grams of acid per mil. With that wetter silage, that's more dilute because we've got more water. So it's only 0.134 grams per mil. So on this side, with these wetter silages, we need more acid to preserve that crop. And we reduce the pH further. And the difference between these two is actually 15% more acid needed on this wetter silage to get to that same level of pH in a theoretical way. Now, that's, that's, that's the theory of it. So we need, when we've got wetter silages, an additive that's going to reduce the pH much more quickly than if we've got a drier silage. That's come with some of these additives that are coming in. So ideally, we want to get that pH in a, in a silage that's below 30% dry matter. We need that pH to be below four to carry out that good preservation and make sure that we've retained those nutrients. Otherwise, we have the risk of more of these enterobacteria and clostridia coming in, producing acetic acid and butyric acid and reducing the quality and reducing the intake. Now, this is a study of a number of samples that I've taken over the last three or four years. 400 farm silages from Wales and England, actually not, not the whole of the UK. And I've looked at the acetic acid concentration versus the dry matter. And when we're, this is 30% or 300 grams per kilogram. When we are on these low dry matter silages, we have a lot more acetic acid. Dry silages, acetic acid is low. Acetic acid is um, a weaker acid than lactic acid. It's actually 10 times less strong than lactic acid. So if we're producing acetic acid in our silage additive, like some of our silage additives do, that contain things like Lactobacillus buchneri, Lactobacillus kefiri, and uh, Lactobacillus elgardii, they're producing more of this acetic acid, and they're making it more difficult to preserve these high protein crops. Ammonia nitrogen, again, when we have lower dry matter, we have higher ammonia nitrogen, and farmers are much more aware of ammonia nitrogen being an impact in terms of uh, intake, but also the fact that it's a, a gauge of protein breakdown. So when we've got our wet silages and we're producing acetic acid in those silages, we're going to increase that level of ammonia nitrogen. We're going to reduce the level of true protein. We're going to use, reduce the ability of that silage to feed our animals and produce milk. So again, looking at this large data set that I have, I, I've looked at silages that had less than 30% dry matter and silages that had greater than 30% dry matter. And the acetic acid concentration in those less than 30% dry matter on average was 30 grams per kilogram acetic acid. And that's the average. So 50% of those will have higher than 30 grams per kilogram. In these higher dry matter silages, then, you know, it's only 15% uh, of 15 grams per kilogram uh, acetic acid. That's much less of a problem. But when we get in these high levels of acetic acid, that becomes a problem to the animal. And this is a study that's just been published from um, looking at a number of studies done over the last few years where they fed silages to dairy cows. And actually they showed that when we reach in the total ration, 17.3 grams per kilogram acetic acid, we have a big decrease in intake. And this is equivalent, um, this is on a 100 kilogram live weight basis. So for a 600 kilo cow, that was a half a kilo dry matter intake drop for every one gram of acetic acid increase over this 17.3 grams per kilogram dry matter level. So we can see that we need to control the fermentation when we've got these high quality silages so that we're not producing too much acetic acid that we're causing an intake issue. So just to finish off, and I know that's uh, been a, a lot of things covered in a relatively short period of time. If we produce high quality silage, we will improve the nutrient content in every mouthful. And the way we do that is by cutting our grass younger before the stem is uh, visible, uh, the seed stems visible from the grass. And when we improve that nutrient content, not only do we have more nutrients in every kilo and every mouthful, but we increase the number of mouthfuls.
there's NDF, the fiber fraction, as that increases, that reduces the intake. And when we do that, we actually feed more forage as a proportion of our total ration. And we must never forget that ruminants, despite the fact that we can feed them concentrates, actually evolve to eat forage. And if we feed more forage, we reduce production diseases. So we've got lower risk of acidosis. We've got lower risk of laminitis. And these are all things that cost you money. And it could be that if we could improve our silage quality, we can reduce those. And overall, we actually will have a benefit in terms of increasing prof profitability and sustainability. Now, how do we get to this high quality silage? We need to cut before the seed stem emerges, like I've said. We need to maintain a 7.5 centimeter stubble height, and we need to rap rapidly wilt, preferably within 20 to 12 hours. But I understand that you know some of you might need a longer wilt. There's always you've got to get the contractor lined up. I would stay a maximum with your grass silages of 24 hours. Use a homo-fermentative inoculant, and by that I mean Lactobacillus parum is the main one, but there's also other species, Pediococcus, for instance. And always for a chemical additive, because they work too. We, we know that they can preserve nutrients, but don't have this negative effect that some of these heterofermentative additives that produce acetic acid have in terms of intake and animal production. But it's always important to seek independent advice. There are a lot of good additives out there. Some aren't so good, but I know that the best additive you'll ever be, be um, persuaded to to, to look at is the, the one that the last um, silage additive sales rep that came down the yard. He's always got the best one. Then finally, fill in thin layers, no more than 15 centimeters deep, have a target density of 750 kilograms of fresh matter or 250 kilograms of dry matter per meter cubed and sheet properly. Gravel bags touching all the way round. If you do all these things, you can keep the nutrition or more of the nutrition that was in that high quality grass that you spent time growing and that will follow through in terms of uh, silage quality and your cows will be much happier, which will give you a peaceful uh, silage feeding period because you'll be having less problems. Thanks for your attention and any questions. Great, thank you very much for that uh, very informative talk this evening, Dave. Um, I'm sure there's a lot there for us to, to take away. So please do send in your questions. Uh, we have a, a couple have come in so please do send them in i think a lot of the the best talk do, does come from questions that come in from yourself so do send them in don't be don't be shy um so you mentioned earlier dave about um putting film on the clamps so you just briefly mentioned it what in your opinion what's the what's the value in using cling film coverings so believe it or not oxygen will pass through your black sheet um it's poly ethylene so it's, it's polythene whereas the cling film has two approaches so some of them are, are a different uh, polymer to start with so they're actually polynitrile some of them those are the ones that they can claim an oxygen barrier they still let some oxygen through but it's it's reduced by over well by a significant amount so that's the first thing the second thing is that all of them do is that because they're so light they actually cling down to the clamp so they cling down to the top of the grass. So it means there's less pockets of air trapped. And to be honest, they're so cheap. There is no reason not to use them. They improve the um, silage quality in that top region. And if you consider how much of your silage is within a foot of the top sheet on many farms, it's 20, 25% of their silage. So that pays for itself time and time again. I've not done the cost benefit, but I suspect it's 10 to 1 back on uh, return on investment. Yeah, I was just going to add on to that. What's the what's the cost of it? But, you know, he seems to say it's quite cheap. So it's definitely worth you know looking into then, isn't it? It definitely is. And if somebody is sceptical about what I've said, and I, you know, I'm a scientist and scientists do get things wrong quite frequently, as we all know. Um, buy a little bit, put it on half the clamp. And I bet you, you'll never go away from not using it ever again. You have your own little project at home. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, thanks, Dave. And we've got another question to come in. If we get caught with rain um, whilst on the site ledge, do we carry on or should we wait for better weather? It's a lovely question. It's the one that, uh, it's a very simple answer, but it's not always the right one. 
I would say if the forage harvest is there, you carry on. Obviously, if it's highly torrential and you are then cutting up the ground, that becomes a mud issue. So that's when I think about stopping. Generally, that silage is only going to get worse. Um, but obviously, if there's a huge amount of rain and you really are getting bringing in wet grass, then it's not a good idea. Um, if you feel like you need to go on and you have got the ability to get a chemical additive there quickly, then a chemical additive will preserve that crop. But yeah, the shorter answer is, you know, you should hopefully with the weather forecast being better than it used to be, we should have that weather window. And the other thing is with this, if you're cutting at a younger stage of growth, you actually need less of a weather window to get that silage in. And that's another benefit of this more frequent cutting system. And to add on to that, really, um, you know, if we do have to stop, should we sheet the silage pit right there and then, or should we wait? You should always see, sheet the silage pit. Even if you have to stop overnight, you should sheet the silage pit. And for those of you that don't, um, and you know, you do, you can get away with it. But many farms that don't sheet overnight, even if there is no rain and they they're carrying on the next day, there will be a line of poorer quality in that clamp when you feed out. And that's because you didn't sheet overnight. And the other thing is if you do stop, don't go and roll it before you bring the next load in. That's a big no-no. Okay, yeah, I'm sure that's you know, something that a lot of, lot of farmers have to think about really, especially with contractors, you know, um, it's a lot of waiting game quite a lot of the time. Yeah, isn't it? and I, I honestly feel, you know, some people say they don't want to stop because they're going to carry on as late as possible and start first thing in the morning. You're better off stopping three or four loads before you finish and sheeting up and it's just pulling the sheet over it's not about putting hundreds of tires on it's about just pulling the sheet over because it makes it anaerobic and it, the fermentation starts and you get a bit of preservation okay thank you um what's the change in percentage dry matter per hour after wilting um that's an impossible question to answer because it depends on so many different factors. Um, but, you know, if we start, it depends on wind, it depends on sun, it depends on density of the crop, you know, heaviness of the crop. But if you've got a, a relatively good crop and you cut at nine in the morning and it's, you know, it's, it's okay weather and you spread that crop, you should in most situations these days with the equipment we've got be able to get up to that 30 percent dry matter within that one day within that 12 hour period but you know each farm's different and, and just on that wilting i think something that i didn't say but different fields will wilt differently because of their perspective to the sun the perspective to slope and wind and it is worth thinking when we when we have a target of 30 percent dry matter we do want the whole clamp to be at 30 percent dry matter because that makes it a more even crop to a silage to feed out but if you've got a field you know wilts more quickly then maybe you should be cutting that last and picking it up first when you come in with a forage harvester because we've got this concept with farmers and you know we're all the same well, i did it in that order so i must pick up in that order and that's not always the right thing to do okay yeah pro that's probably something you know maybe if you if, if you're picking up the silage yourself it's quite easy for you to tell but maybe if you get a contractor in maybe it's more difficult to sometimes it's easier just to ask them to go in this order and, uh, I think and carry on isn't it you make a valid point but i think farmers need to remember that they're paying for that contractor and they've got to feed that silage throughout the year so it's the job they want and you know contractors are bright people as well they, they could change the order um if if tedding twice how long after the first pass should you wait for the second You've got tough questions going in. <laughs> they're, 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 they're not tough. They're just ones I can't give a precise answer to because, you know, it does depend on how quickly it's drying. But, you know, if it's a good drying day, I'd say four or five hours is enough. If it's a poorer drying day, then it'll need longer. And, you know, maybe you could do a, a dry matter test, which uh, if you cut the grass to two inch lengths uh, and squeeze it, then if there's a lot of water coming out between your fingers, then that's below 20% dry matter. If it's dried, um, if there's only a few drops, then that's 25% dry matter. So you can gauge how much it's dried and how much it's wilted. But the other thing is, you know, if you think you need to go in, feel the bottom of the sward next to the ground and the top, and see how dry, you know, how different they are. And if the, you know, if the top's dry, then it's time to go in with a tethering it. 
Okay, thank you. Um, silage additives, are they good, bad? You know, what, what are the indifference is? Um, or when should you use, or what, what type? Right. If you've got ideal grass, perfect weather conditions, that's when a good additive is worth more to you because you will get better payback because it will preserve more of those nutrients. If you've had a disaster, you've, you've missed your harvest window by two weeks, it's all stemmy, but the weather's now good, that, and you can get it dry enough quickly enough, that's when the additive becomes less valuable because you've lost the nutrition. And then, like I said, there's, there's, there are good additives out there. I, and unfortunately, there's an increasing number of additives that I don't recommend anymore because they've got the wrong bacteria. They're actually detrimental to the fermentation and there's no evidence of animal performance benefits. So I think, you know, there's a limited number of sources you can go to, but Farming Connect does have a silage additive leaflet and it's going to the independent resources or actually, and this might be, you know, in this day and age where we've got people using the internet, if you've got the, the, the number of the strains of the bacteria, which you should have from, from the information, you can Google that and you can find out whether there's any published research on it very quickly um, on Google or Google Scholar and, and it'll tell you. And that the way you're not reliant on somebody that's making their money from selling the additive. And that's what bugs me. There's too many people telling you the things that you aren't true about silage additives, but there are some damn good ones there that are worth the money. Yeah, and you know, with um, with Farming Connect, we can offer advice with that as well. So, if you are if you are struggling or don't know where to start, do, do get in touch um, or get in touch with Dave, and we can all help you out. So, don't be afraid to ask your questions, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, and then we've got a question. Um, you, sort, you sort of mentioned it before. How long or short should the forage harvester cut length be? So that depends on the dry matter. And again, there are guides in, in booklets, but as a rough guide, don't keep me to this because I slightly forget the exact numbers, but if it's, it's all based on dry matter. So if you've got a, a dry matter less than 20%, then you need a chop length of that forage coming into your clamp at actually seven to 10 centimeters. If it's uh, uh, 25 to 28%, you can drop that to, um, so 10 centimeters, you drop that to seven and a half. When you're at 30% dry matter, you need to be down to two and a half to five centimeters. And the reason why it changes with dry matter is that if we over consolidate a wet silage, we've got a risk of clamp slippage. And that's why we need that longer forage. So it's not about the cow. It's the only time silage making is not about the cow. It's about the dry matter. So if we fit that our ideal of 30% dry matter, we should be between two and a half and and five centimeters if we've missed the target and we're really dry then we need to be two and a half and even shorter because that's about compaction and getting good compaction and yeah we've just had one um asking for any top tips to avoid slippage please i know i've seen quite a few videos um this year of slippage more maybe uh, in england but yeah have you got any tips uh you know slippage is a bit you know in england is a bit like the english rugby team isn't it Going downhill. Anyway, um, there are a number of things, and I just well, last year completed a project with AHDB looking at slippage. So on the AHDB website, there is the, the project report. But there's a, there's a two or three things that I picked up in this survey. So I surveyed 10 farms um, that had slippage. And the first thing is even compaction. So on nine out of those 10 farms, I could measure the compaction density um, with depth in the silage clamp. And there was a region low down in the clamp that was poor density with higher density above it. So basically there was, in every cubic meter of silage above it, there was a lot more weight um, than this poor area. So it actually put in too much weight on a poor density. So it had actually slipped out. So the first thing is to compact evenly as you're filling the clamp. And I know many farms, they'll put five, six loads in and then they'll come and start rolling. And that's a big mistake. Also, they'll think, oh, I need two tractors on for the last half a day. And I only have one tractor rolling the clamp during the first period. And when I spoke to these farmers that had slippage, they, they agreed with me. They'd had issues at certain times where they'd left the clamp, they'd gone off, a cow was calving, they'd had problems. So they hadn't compacted it so well. So 
So that's the first one. The second one was actually compacting angle with a packing tractor. So if you compact too steeply, you actually end up with, with um, rather than transferring the force directly down on that silage to make it compact, you're actually pushing some of the force down the bank that you're going up. So actually you're causing that slip zone to occur whilst you're packing that silage because you've gone too steep. So despite what it says in the latest AHDB forage guide, we should never have a packing um, elevation greater than 20% because that significantly increases the forces. And that's another big problem because, you know, sometimes you've got often, and I'm going to be ageist and sexist, a young guy on the clamp thinking that he can push his tractor up as steep as ramp as possible and he's doing damage. So we need to go in at relatively even levels. And then the other one is that, that chop length and the dry matter. So do vary the chop length with the dry matter. And just finally, if you're making high quality leafier material, they are more prone to slippage. So again, you need to follow those rules even more. And actually with the high quality, you can, can increase that chop length because you're going to get that good density anyway, because there's not so much fiber in there. Is that something you see more with multi-cut silage then? Or? The survey I did, I wouldn't say I did see more with multi-cut, but that might just be because the farms that came forward weren't, um, weren't, you know, it was just a random selection rather than specifically looking. But it is likely to be more of a problem with multi-cut, but mm. it's not definitely a problem. And, you know, if you get to above 32% dry matter or around that 32, the, the, the risk of slippage is much lower. It tends to be in wetter silages. Okay. Um, we've got uh, another question. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll make this the last question. Um, my cows are always uh, always seem to have better, higher intakes and perform better on higher dry matter silage, 35 plus. Why is it recommended 28 to 32%? Right. My recommendation is 28 to 32 because I know many farmers can't manage their silage when they get drier than that. 35 would be the ideal target if we had very good clamp management. So that's why I tend to bring it back a bit. Now, if you've got 35% dry matter target, don't forget that you should be calculating dry matter intake, not fresh matter intake. But 35, you're eating less water and you're controlling that fermentation that bit better. So that's why the intakes are better. But given and, you know, maybe the, the conditions, the weather conditions, if they're good, you can hit that 35 quickly. In the past, we've had poor weather. We generally have poor weather around silage making time, and that means a much longer wilt. So actually our losses in the field are, are worse. But, you know, if we get good weather, we get to 35 quickly. I've got no problem with it. I don't like silages above 35% dry matter because that starts causing all sorts of problems. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much, Dave. I think uh, that's all the questions for now. We are coming to the hour mark. Um, so it's your last chance to send in your questions um, whilst I sort of close the webinar this evening. So thank you very much uh, for all your questions. And thank you very much for Dave for your very informative presentation this evening. Um, very interesting. And like, like Dave said, if you do require any information, please do get in touch. And we do also have a few fact sheets on our website. Um, and HDB website. We do as well, um, just to mention, we have um, a dem demonstration <laughs> farm in Carmarthenshire where we are uh, looking at uh, forage and milk from forage. And that project has started now um, this year. So the first half of the project is looking at grassland management and the second project is looking at the silage making and that's um, with Dave Davis. So do keep an eye out um, on our social media and on our website. Um, and hopefully we will have an event there. Um, fingers crossed as things are going at the moment um, over the next year or before the end of the year. Um, so we are hoping to see you face to face um, soon. Uh, but for now, we are still on our webinars. Um, so thank you very much. If we'd appreciate if you could fill in the um, evaluation sheet at the end, it, it really does help us with our future webinars. Um, you know, it's a lot of help. It's if there is anything you want us to discuss, um, or if you want to discuss anything with us, just let us know. Um, I'll have, we'll have a look, a look at them for you. Um, so yeah, Dukhavoram Khigid, William Heno, and Dukhavoram E. Dave, 
um, um, a, a presentation uh, a good evening. Thank you. Oh.